and I mean congratulations to um, the joint organisers, the Radical History Group and Bristol Stop the War for getting such a fantastic uh, turnout and for taking the initiative really in trying to get something off the ground in Bristol because we really do need to do, I think, four years of campaigning as this centenary uh, rolls out because our rulers are choosing to use it as an ideological uh, battleground, and I'm going to say something about that in just a moment. But I want to start by making this very simple point. If you read the letters, the diaries, the memoirs of soldiers who fought in the First World War, they don't talk very much about heroes. They talk about mud and lice and bad rations, and people being torn apart, and losing comrades, and the camaraderie of ordinary soldiers facing the horror of modern industrialised warfare. They do that. But generally speaking, they don't talk about heroes, and they don't make distinctions among themselves. And that's also reflected in our war memorials and our war cemeteries, because there was such universal revulsion against what happened between 1914 and 1918 that the rulers of Britain had no choice but to, but to democratise the way in which they remembered the soldiers. That's not what they used to do. What they'd done in the 19th century, they dumped the bodies of working class soldiers in a pit near the battlefield and they'd ship back the officers and they'd end up with a brass plaque in the local parish church. They couldn't do that after the First World War because they'd killed so many and the revulsion was so great. They had to democratise the way in which the fallen were thought about because of the radicalisation that followed the war. What our rulers now want to do, now that the last Tommy who fought in the trenches is dead, and that's just as well for our rulers, because if, it, if Harry Patch was still alive, they'd find it much more difficult to carry this argument. What they now want to do is to reconfigure the way in which we think about the First World War as a story about heroism and glory and empire. They intend to roll out round about 400 ceremonies across Britain to unveil paving stones, commemorative paving stones, which are going to be placed in prominent places in all of the hometowns of the VC winners of the First World War. Now, if that isn't an attempt to reconfigure the way we think about the First World War and turn it into a story about heroism and military glory, it's difficult to imagine what other scheme they might come up with to do that. That is part of what they are planning to do, and that is one of the things that we as anti-war campaigners, anti-war activists, anti-imperialists need to be actively involved in challenging. Why does this matter? Why does the, the government uh, drive to commemorate the First World War in a particular way, to celebrate British victory, which is what some of them are saying we should do? Why does it matter that there's a raft of revisionist historians who are putting essentially pro-war arguments in relation to uh, 1914. Why is this an argument that we need to engage with? Because, of course, history is about the present. History is all about, always about the present. It's to do with the fact that in August of last year, they lost a vote in the House of Commons in launching an attack on Syria. Finally, after 12 years of campaigning by a mass anti-war movement, that most pathetically pale reflection of public opinion, that is the House of Commons. Finally, even the House of Commons voted down their proposal to start a new war. Gove was apparently absolutely livid. He was spitting abuse at the people who voted it down in the lobbies um, afterwards. And when uh, the Tory Defence Secretary appeared on Newsnight within half an hour of the vote. He said, Iraq has poisoned the well of public opinion. The generals are supposedly fretting about the degree to which the shift in public opinion has constrained their ability in the future to project military power. 
Because our rulers need to be able to do that in defence of empire and profit. Because that is still about the way in which the world works. Empire and profit. The use of military power, the projection of military power to protect their interests in other parts of the world. They need the freedom to use that military power and it's constrained by the way they've lost the control, lost control over the war on terror and the way in which the anti-war movement has risen to oppose what they're doing. Tearing one society after another apart. That is a problem for them. So they want to retell the story of the First World War as a story between good empires and bad empires. People who on the one hand represent aggression and militarism and people who on the other supposedly represent democracy and enlightenment and truth, beauty and justice. That's the story they're trying to tell us. They're saying about Germany in 1914 that Germany was an exceptionally aggressive power. They're saying about Germany that it was an exceptionally autocratic society. And they're saying that Germany was guilty of starting the war. Aggressive Germany, nasty Germany, guilty Germany. That's basically the argument, in a nutshell, that they're projecting. And I want to unpack that argument, but I want to make just one or two specific points in relation to it initially. Understanding why wars happen is not to do with looking at who fires the first shot. It's to do with understanding the entire context within which wars take place. And you can look at what happened in 1914 from the point of view of the British ruling class, and that's the view that's reflected by people like Michael Gove and Max Hastings. Or you can look at it from the point of view of the German ruling class. And I stress the German ruling class. I've got no truck with them, any more than I have with the ruling class in Britain. But I can see how they saw things differently in 1914. They saw themselves losing an arms race. They saw them be themselves being outbuilt in the Anglo-Naval arms race in the run-up to the First World War. They saw the Russian army modernising on one flank and the French army getting bigger on the other flank. They felt themselves to be encircled. And they were a power that had unified late, creating a nation-state late in the 19th century and that had industrialised late. And in the competition, because that's what it was, for markets, for raw materials, for places where you could invest your surplus capital, they found that most of the world had already been carved up. Not, in, not only were they being encircled in Europe, but most of the world had already been carved up by the British and the French, primarily. That's how Germany's rulers experienced 19, uh, 1914. They thought they were losing. They thought they were losing ground, and they decided to go for it in 1914 because they thought that a war was coming. That's not to justify it. It's just to explain it. It's to explain that this is part of an insane system. Let's try and unpack it now in a more sophisticated way. Because there are really always two ways of looking at history. You can look at history from above. We'll start by that, with that. And then we'll look at it in a different way. I'll tell you what you see if you look at it from above in 1914. In one place you see a group of bankers and industrialists and arms manufacturers and generals and admirals gathered around a German cross. And then you pan across and you see another group of the same sort of people bankers and industrialists and arms manufacturers and generals and admirals, and they're gathered around a French tricolour. And then you pan across again, and you see another bunch of the same sort of people, and they're gathered around a Union Jack. And they're all competing with each other, because they've created a mad world based on competition. A world divided in com into competing corporations, competing industrial corporations, competing financial corporations, a world divided into competing nation states, a world divided into competing empires. And they are competing with each other 
for access to raw materials, for markets for the goods which their factories are producing, for contracts to build railways, for places to which they can sell their armaments, for opportunities to export capital in order to continue to accumulate wealth, in order to continue to make profit. And because of that competition, they had, in the course of about 40 years, divided up almost the whole of Africa. It was called the Scramble for Africa. In 1870, about 10% of Africa was ruled by Europeans. By the time of the First World War, more than 90% of Africa was ruled by Europeans. And it was because that struggle for empire had exhausted the potential that the war, or the conflict, the tension, returned to Europe and turned into an arms race, and then exploded in 1914. And fundamentally what it was in 1914 was a war to decide which group of immensely rich people <coughs> would get even richer at the expense of which other group in a war for empire and profit. That's what it was about. That's one way of looking at the world, from above. And of course there's another way. You can look at it from below. And if you look at it from below, it always looks very different. Being down in the shit looking up is very different from being up there with the elite, with the rich, with the bankers, with the industrialists. And if you are a Welsh miner on strike against poverty wages and the slum in which you're condemned to live your life, the enemy is not a German miner sent into the trenches. The enemy is the mine boss. And the same is true if you're a German miner in the Ruhr. Your enemy is the mine boss. And the same is true if you're a Czech miner in Bohemia. And the same is true if you're a Russian miner in the Donbass. And the same is true right the way across Europe for working people. For working people, the enemy is at home. Very often, in 1914, you could see the enemy's mansion on the hill, because very often the bosses lived cheek by jowl with the workers they exploited. If you're a suffragette, in 1914, the enemy's not the Kaiser. At least if you're a British suffragette, it's not. If you're a German woman fighting for the right to vote, then admittedly the Kaiser is the enemy. But if you're a British woman fighting for the right to vote, the enemy is the British government, the liberal government <coughs> that denies the right to vote uh, to women. If you're Irish, the enemy is the British Empire, not the German Empire. If you're Egyptian, living under British rule. The enemy is the British Empire. If you're an Indian, if you're one of the 300 million people living under British rule in India, the enemy is the British Empire. One in four people on the planet had as their main enemy the British Empire, because that's how much the British had grabbed. They controlled one-fifth of the world's land surface and one quarter of the world's people in 1914. So if you're down at the bottom, you experience the world in a very, very different way and your enemy is not the enemy, that your rulers tell you you should be fighting. And that's why the First World War was contested. And we have to tease out that contested history of the First World War that they want to deny. It was contested before it started. There were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Europe protesting against war in the July crisis of 1914. It's estimated that there were three quarters of a million demonstrators on the streets of German cities alone in the course of the July crisis in 1914. There had been resolution after resolution after resolution passed 
at Socialist Party conferences, at trade union conferences, at meetings of the Socialist International, condemning war, warning about war, saying there would be mass action, there would be calls for mass action in the event of war. We might want to have a discussion about why that was not delivered upon. Suffice it to say, the anti-war opinion was massive. Tens of millions of people across Europe were opposed to war. Now, we know there's a wave of jingoism when the war breaks out. We know that in 1914, nationalism, often tinged with racism, is used to suppress, is used to flatten the anti-war mood, is used to flatten the socialist movement. We know that. We know that initially the ruling class is able to achieve that sea change, apparent sea change, almost overnight uh, in public opinion. War has that effect because it has its own logic. It has its own ideology. But some on our side, on the side of working people, did not succumb. And they faced the abuse. They faced the often physical abuse. They faced very often imprisonment. Occasionally, their health was destroyed and sometimes they were killed because they were a small, beleaguered minority of people opposing the war when it was very, very hard to oppose the war and in that way keeping the flag flying. And that mattered <coughs> because in time, of course, the experience of modern industrialised slaughter in the trenches and the privation at home meant that opinion began to shift. And that was going on steadily, all the time. The mole of history was at work through the long years of the war. The mole of history suddenly surfaced in Christmas, Christmas 1914, when along the front line, and it was massive, the scale of it, the Christmas truce, along the front line, the British soldiers and the German soldiers stopped fighting each other. That they, they estimate that two-thirds of the British line was affected by the Christmas troops. This was a huge fraternisation of ordinary soldiers. The mole of history momentarily raised his head and then disappeared again. But he's working. And in 1917, it explodes. It explodes in a wave of militancy, both among soldiers, a wave of... Uh, Mutinies in the French army, for example, a collapse of the Italian army um, on the battlefront at the end of 1917, and of course, the explosion of revolution in Russia, as hundreds of thousands of peasant conscript soldiers refuse to fight, climb out of the trenches, head for home, shoot down the officers who try and, uh, try and stop. And then in 1918, the war having been stopped on the Eastern Front, by the mass action of workers uh, and soldiers, the war is shut down on the Western Front by the eruption of the German Revolution. And the sequence is this. <coughs> the Germans were losing. The Germans were being pushed back on the Western Front. But the key thing was the morale of the German army. Could they keep the German army fighting in the trenches? What tipped it? What made it decisive that they could not rely on being able to do that was the revolution which started in Kiel, when the sailors of the German high seas fleet refused to put to sea. And the way in which that revolution spread from Kiel across the cities of Germany, so that the red flags went up right the way across Germany, including Berlin, the capital. That's before the armistice. And it's that that persuades the German generals. They have to make peace. It's that that means that the Kaiser is forced uh, to abdicate and that the armistice is agreed on the 11th um, of November 1918. Revolution shut down the First World War on the Eastern Front and then it shut down the First World War on the Western Front. It was a great revolt of ordinary working people, some in uniform, some at home, against the horrors of what had happened between 1914 and 1918 um, that brought it uh, to an end. We must tell that story. We must tell the story that says what the rulers of the world did 
between 1914 and 1918 <coughs> was create a world gone mad. Anybody who thinks that what happened between 1914 and 1918, when the products of human labor were turned into a vast mechanism for the destruction of life, killing some 15 million people. Anybody who thinks that that is part of any kind of rational world order has to be insane. That is, by any definition, a world gone mad. And it went mad because the system was dysfunctional. A system divided into competing corporations, divided into competing nation states, divided into competing empires, as the world still is. That is dysfunctional. It does not conform to human need. It creates a situation where the products of our collective labour are sometimes turned into a monstrous mechanism of destruction by our rulers that tears societies apart in a way that has happened again and again and again since the first fully industrialised war began in 1914. We have to project that argument. We have to project the argument that because of that, the war was contested at the time and ultimately it was, it was defeated by a revolt of ordinary people and we have to assert that argument through the four years of the centenary so that our rulers do not recover their confidence and their capacity to project military power across the world and tear other societies apart in the period ahead, which is their intention. <laughs> Can I first of all just draw people's attention to the No Glory pamphlet, which is on sale um, at the end, and that's uh, four quid for those who haven't got it. I can tell you that it's been selling very well. Um, it's, I, I shouldn't say this because I wrote it, but uh, <laughs> I've been given to believe it's, it's proving to be an effective campaign tool in communicating a basic argument very efficiently to uh, a, a broad general audience who doesn't want to read a whole book on the First World War, but is willing perhaps to, to, to read a pamphlet about it. So just to draw your attention to the fact that that is there. And then I want to talk a little bit about how you stop wars. And in talking about how you stop wars, I'm also in a sense talking generally about how history works. Because actually when they project military power, when they go to war, we're talking about a major historical event where there are powerful vested interests at stake, in play, if you like. History often turns on decisions to go to war or not, as the case may be. This is about how history uh, works. And let me say very, very clearly, I am in favour of direct action. Unequivocally so. And I'll tell you what the two conditions of it are. You need political clarity. And that's what was missing among the socialist and trade union leaders in 1914. And I'll tell you what the mistake was. They had confused nation and class. National interest, which means the interests of rulers. It means the interests of those people who are divided into competing groups of bankers and industrialists and generals that I was talking about um, earlier on. That's what national interest means. It means you line up with the rich. You line up with the corporations. You line up with your own rulers. Working people do not have a national interest. Working people have an international interest in siding with other people like themselves at the bottom of the system. We have that general interest as working people, as ordinary people, as poor people. That was the mistake that, the, that the, the mainstream socialists and trade union leaders made. They thought there was a national interest, which was, which was an interest which encompassed miners and dockers and people fighting for the right to uh, vote and so on. You need political clarity, but we do not have a national interest. And when our rulers wave a national flag, we say, no, our enemy is not abroad. 
Our enemy is here. Our enemy is the people here at home, out to destroy the welfare state, out to privatise the National Health Service, out to drive down wages, out to drive disabled people to suicide because their benefits have been cut. The enemy is at home, not abroad. You need that political clarity, but you need something else. You need, you need this. You need mass forces. And all of my sympathies for the young comrades uh, in, in, in the room who are saying they want to fight. They want to fight effectively. You need mass forces. And that is how history works. And when you have mass forces and you are in a position to challenge their wealth and their power, they will resist. And you will need mass direct action to break them. Again and again and again when our side wins victories, it involves mass forces on our side confronting the mass violence that is represented um, by the system. I'm going to give you just one or two examples of this. I just want to pick up Roger's point actually about the length of the, uh, of the centenary. I agree with you completely, Roger. Um, I'm wrong to say it's, it's four years. It, it's even longer than five years, possibly, because it sort of rolls on, in a way, that great wave of revolution swept across the world right up until 1923, really, and we ought to be exploring the whole um, of that history. When you look at that history, what stops the war is mass direct action. What limits the ability of the imperial powers to remake the world in the way that they want to. What limits their ability to do that is mass direct action. It's the great wave of strikes that were being talked about. The real power of workers to bring their system to a halt. It's the wave of mutinies. It's the wave of mass refusal to carry on with the killing uh, that stops the war. If you think about Vietnam, Vietnam's another victory. For our side, we stopped that war. The alliance between anti-war protesters um, in the, particularly in the United States, but to a degree in Western Europe, and the resistance of the Vietnamese on the ground, that stopped that war. And the soldiers. And, and well, I was just going to no, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And the point is this: the direct action flows from the logic of the struggle. What the American soldiers did as they, as they turned against the war, it's called fragging. You chuck a fragmentation grenade into the, into the tent of a gung-ho uh, officer who'd just come out of West Point and was going to lead his men um, into the jungle. They chucked a fragmentation grenade into the tent and got rid of it. And the American boys basically stopped fighting uh, that war. The, the direct action flowed out of the logic of the situation. What did it mean in the States? It meant burning draft cards. It meant mass refusal to join the draft. The direct action that broke the ability of the American leadership to continue that horrific war against the Vietnamese uh, was about direct action. Here's my last example. And it's uh, a particular favourite of mine. And um, of course, Harry Patch in that bit of film that uh, Colin showed earlier on, he was, he, it, it was it was that particular song, and there's a story about that song, a little bit of direct, local direct action, local to me, because um, I live in St. Albans, just down the road from Luton, in 1990. It's a good example, too, Roger, of this history from below that we need to explore. Um, in 1919, they, 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 were holding, they were planning to hold a, a big victory celebration in Luton Town Hall. The mayor had organised this, this event. But he didn't bother to invite the ex-servicemen, the men who'd the Tommies who'd actually done the fighting. They didn't get an invitation. It was only for the big wigs. It was only for presumably all the people, all the rich people who stayed at home making money out of the war. So what did they do? The ex-servicemen marched down to Luton Town Hall and they formed a ring around it. They ransacked it. They threw all of the, you know, they, where they were planning to have their banquet, their grand banquet, all that was chucked out into the street. And then they set fire to it. And they sang, we'll keep the home fires burning. <laughs> Thank you.
opinion, that is the House of Commons. Finally, even the House of Commons voted down their proposal to start a new war. Gove was apparently absolutely livid. He was spitting abuse at the people who voted it down in the lobbies um, afterwards. And when uh, the Tory Defence Secretary appeared on Newsnight within half an hour of the vote, he said, Iraq has poisoned the well of public opinion. The generals are supposedly fretting about the degree to which the shift in public opinion has constrained their ability in the future to project military power. Because our rulers need to be able to do that in defence of empire and profit. Because that is still about the way in which the world works. Empire and profit. The use of military power, the projection of military power to protect their interests in other parts of the world. They need the freedom to use that military power and it's constrained by the way they've lost the control, lost control over the war on terror and the way in which the anti-war movement has risen. They talk about mud and lice and bad rations and people being torn apart and losing comrades and the camaraderie of ordinary soldiers facing the horror of modern industrialised warfare. They do that. But generally speaking, they don't talk about heroes and they don't make distinctions among themselves. And that's also reflected in our war memorials and our war cemeteries because there was such universal revulsion against what happened between 1914 and 1918 that the rulers of Britain had no choice but to, but to democratise the way in which they remembered the soldiers. That's not what they used to do. What they'd done in the 19th century, they dumped the bodies of working class soldiers in a pit near the battlefield and they'd ship back the officers and they'd end up with a brass plaque in the local parish church. They couldn't do that after the First World War because they'd killed so many and the revulsion was so great. They had to democratise the Congratulations to um, the joint organisers, the Radical History Group and Bristol Stop the War, for getting such a fantastic uh, turnout and for taking the initiative, really, in trying to get something off the ground in Bristol, because we really do need to do, I think, four years of campaigning as this centenary uh, rolls out, because our rulers are choosing to use it as an ideological uh, battleground, and I'm going to say something about that in just a moment. But I want to start by making this very simple point. If you read the letters, the diaries, the memoirs of soldiers who fought in the First World War, they don't talk very much about heroes, the way in which the fallen were thought about because of the radicalisation that followed the war. What our rulers now want to do, now that the last Tommy who fought in the trenches is dead, and that's just as well for our rulers, because if, it, if Harry Patch was still alive, they'd find it much more difficult to carry this argument. What they now want to do is to reconfigure the way in which we think about the First World War as a story about heroism and glory and empire. They intend to roll out round about 400 ceremonies across Britain to unveil paving stones, commemorative paving stones, which are going to be placed in prominent places in all of the hometowns of the VC winners of the First World War. Now, if that isn't an attempt to reconfigure the way we think about the First World War and turn it into a story about heroism and military glory, it's difficult to imagine what other scheme they might come up with to do that. That is part of what they are planning to do, and that is one of the things that we as anti-war campaigners, anti-war activists, anti-imperialists need to be actively involved in challenging. Why does this matter? Why does the, the government uh, drive to commemorate the First World War in a particular way, to celebrate 
British victory, which is what some of them are saying we should do. Why does it matter that there's a raft of revisionist historians who are putting essentially pro-war arguments in relation to uh, 1914? Why is this an argument that we need to engage with? Because, of course, history is about the present. History is all about, always about the present. It's to do with the fact that in August of last year, they lost a vote in the House of Commons in launching an attack on Syria. Finally, after 12 years of campaigning by a mass anti-war movement, that most pathetically pale reflection of public 